Hello, everyone, and welcome to Uncivil Law, where we learn through others' misfortunes. To help increase your legal knowledge, please hit the subscribe button. For today's story, we have one of importance to lawyers everywhere. This is the case of Zachary Greenberg versus James Haggerty in his role as the chair of the disciplinary board of the Supreme Court of Pennsylvania. Now, recently, we had a law grad who was suing their admission board in a different state, in a different case. And we read that and we commented on that and we found it a little bit less than persuasive. But this one is not of that territory. This one is actually a, a well-written argument. It has to deal with a new rule that has been proposed to the rules of ethics for lawyers and has been adopted by a few states. Not very many, but there are a few. This is proposed rule 8.4 in the rules of ethics that lawyers are supposed to follow. Pennsylvania has adopted it. And as you're going to see, it raises some very serious First Amendment problems. So we're going to read this and we're going to read this decision on this. Let's get started with this. The plaintiff, Zachary Greenberg, graduated from law school in 2016 and was admitted to the Pennsylvania Bar in 2019. He's a relatively recent law school graduate and an even more recently uh, admitted attorney in Pennsylvania. The plaintiff works as a program officer for the Foundation of Individual Rights in Education. Okay, so immediately, immediately my sympathies are with this guy because I'm a big fan of the Foundation of Individual Rights in Education. They do some outstanding work in freedom of speech domain. And they're one of the organizations that I might want to work for, you know, if I if I wasn't doing my current job, because I think they do such great work just destroying all the universities who want to fringe the freedom of speech stuff. So this guy is working as a, as a new lawyer. He's working for the Foundation for Individual Rights in Education. And now he'd like to protect his individual rights too. So way to go, man. You, 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 you carry the spirit of us on your wings. Plaintiff is also a member of the First Amendment Lawyers Association, which regularly conducts continuing legal education for its members. Specifically, the plaintiff has written and spoken against banning hate speech on university campuses and university regulation of hateful speech online as protected by the First Amendment, as the foundation does. He, he goes to universities and says, hey, you shouldn't ban the first speech, the hate speech. In 2016, the disciplinary board of the Supreme Court of Pennsylvania considered adopting a version of the American Bar Association Model Rule of Conduct 8.4 in Pennsylvania. The Supreme Court of Pennsylvania approved the recommendation of the board to adopt the proposed Rule 8.4 and included it in the new rule along with two comments. Okay, so the Pennsylvania Supreme Court approved this rule and adopted this rule. This is a model rule. So the model rules of professional conduct is what I think every state but one uses. One state is still using like the older version of this, which I can't even remember what it's called. It's called something else, but there was an older version of this that had a completely different name. I think there's one or two states that are still using like the old version of it for some reason. But in any case, at this point, pretty much every state is using model rules. Now every state adopts them a little bit differently. And rule 8.4 is a new admission and has been extremely controversial and has not been well adopted. All right, so what is Rule 8.4, at least in Pennsylvania, and why is it so controversial? You'll understand this pretty, this both pretty well so far. Okay, so here's what Rule 8.4 says in the model rules, or not even the model rules, in the Pennsylvania Rules of Ethics for Lawyers. It is professional misconduct for a lawyer to, in the practice of law, by words or conduct, knowingly manifest bias or prejudice, or engage in harassment or discrimination, as those terms are defined in applicable federal, state, or local statutes or ordinances, including, but not limited to, bias, prejudice, harassment, or discrimination based on race, sex, gender identity, or dis expression, religion, national origin, ethnicity, disability, age, sexual orientation, marital status, or socioeconomic status. So you can't, you can't harass or discriminate or prejudice it, it, in, as it's defined in any federal, state, or local statute or ordinance for any of these reasons as a lawyer. Okay. This paragraph does not limit the ability of a lawyer to accept a client or withdraw from representation in accordance with the rule, and the paragraph does not preclude advocacy or advice consistent with the rules. And then there are some notes or comments which are attached to the rules, which is also very, very common. So here are the comments that were attached to the rule. For the purposes of paragraph G, the one that we just read, conduct in the practice of law includes, includes participation in activities that are required for a lawyer to practice law, including but not limited to continuing legal education seminars, bench bar conferences, and bar association activities where legal education credits are offered. So not just what you're doing in the courtroom, 
but also anything that you're doing in any context that is needed to be a lawyer, such as continuing legal education. The substantive law of anti-discrimination, anti-harassment statutes and case law guide that applicability and clarify the scope. So also, in addition to looking up every state, federal and local law, you also have to look up the substantive law and the case law to figure out what you can and cannot discriminate against. That sounds like a lot of category. Now you understand why it's so controversial. The plaintiff filed a complaint in this court going on the offensive, alleging that the amendments consist of a content-based and viewpoint-based discrimination and are overbroad in violation of the First Amendment, and that the amendments to the rules are unconstitutionally vague in violation of the 14th Amendment. Because this action involves alleged suppression of speech in violation of the First Amendment, we focus on the first factor of the matter for an injunction, whether the plaintiff is likely to succeed on the merits of a constitutional claim. The loss of First Amendment freedoms for even minimal periods of times unquestionably constitutes irreparable injury. To establish standing to bring a lawsuit, a plaintiff must show an injury in fact, a sufficient causal connection between the injury and the conduct, and a likelihood the injury can be redressed. Were you hurt? Was it hurt by the thing they did? Can a court do something about it? An injury is sufficient to satisfy Article 3, must be concrete and particularized, an actual or imminent, not conjectural or hypothetical. An allegation of future injury may suffice, however, if the threatened injury is certainly impending or there's a substantial risk of harm, it will occur. The court, therefore, must determine if the threatened enforcement of the amendments to the rules for ethics creates an Article Three injury. When an individual is subject to such a threat, an actual arrest, prosecution, or other enforcement action is not a prerequisite to challenging the law. Many circuit courts have found a plaintiff allegation that the law is or will have chilling effects on speech is sufficient to satisfy injury in fact. The Third Circuit has held that allegation is certain conduct is and or will have chilling effect must present a claim of specific harm or threat of specific future harm. And the Fifth Circuit has repeatedly held in the pre-enforcement context that chilling speech is a constitutional harm adequate to satisfy the injury in fact requirement. In terms of the injury in fact, plaintiff alleges in the complaint that the vast majority of topics discussed at plaintiff speaking events are considered to be biased, prejudiced, offensive, and hateful by some managers of his audience and some members at large. Plaintiff further alleges that during his presentation, plaintiff's discussion of hateful speech protected by the First Amendment involves a detailed summarization of law in this area, which includes a walkthrough of prominent presidential First Amendment cases addressing incendiary speech. The plaintiff alleges it would be nearly impossible to illustrate the United States First Amendment jurisprudence, such as by accurately citing and quoting presidential First Amendment cases, without also engaging in speech that at least some members of the audience will perceive as biased, prejudiced, offensive, or potentially hateful. Plaintiff alleges that he believes that every one of his speaking engagements on the First Amendment issues carries a risk that some audience member will file a disciplinary complaint against him based on the content of his presentation under this new rule. The plaintiff alleges he fears his writing and speeches could be misconstrued by writer, readers and listeners and state officials within the board as violating the rule. The defendants, meanwhile, contend that conduct in which the plaintiff wants to engage that is providing detailed summarizations of the law regarding hateful speech, is not forbidden by the plain language of the amendments. As the amendments require the plaintiff to knowingly manifest bias or prejudice or knowingly engage in discrimination or harassment, defendants contend that it strains credulity to believe that citing and quoting cases could lead to disciplinary action. I don't know, ma'am. I don't know, man. In this day and age, it strains credulity to think that, you know, merely quoting cases accurately could be perceived as hate speech or interpret as such, or someone could file a complaint. I don't know, man. Seems like that, that's the thing that could happen. The plaintiff contends that he plans to continue speaking at continuing legal education events on controversial and polarizing issues, such as hate speech, regulation on college campuses or online, due process requirements for students accused of sexual misconduct. That won't generate any uh, hate speech complaints, right? And campaign finance restrictions on monetary political contributions. Plaintiff notes that his presentations include summarizing and using language from a number of cases that in the past have offended and will continue to offend audience members. Plaintiff notes that Rule 8.4 prescribes words or conduct manifesting bias or prejudice at CLE seminars and that the complaint contains many examples of people labeling speakers as biased and prejudiced for merely taking policy positions for discussing statistics or academic theories, for espousing legal views or maintaining certain epitaphs 
or, or mentioning certain epitaphs as part of academic discussion. So in his complaints, he said, here's a whole bunch of times people have said that these words are harmful, hateful, and all the rest of it, merely for doing things that I'm doing as well and trying to present the law fairly and say, yeah, you know, it's all that way. The plaintiff contends that there is a credible threat of enforcement. When dealing with pre-enforcement challenges to recently enacted or at least non moribund statutes that facially restrict expressive activity by the class to which the plaintiff belongs, courts will assume a credible threat of prosecution in absence of compelling contrary evidence. The court finds the plaintiff has standing to bring this pre-enforcement challenge to the amendments. First, the court finds plaintiff's allegation that speech will be chilled by the amendment shows that there is a threat of a specific future harm. The court concludes that plaintiff alleged chilling effect constitutes an injury in fact that is concrete, particularized, and imminent. Plaintiff's allegation of future injury suffice because plaintiff has shown the threat of injury is impending and there's a substantial risk that the harm will occur. The plaintiff has also shown a likelihood that the activity in which he intends to engage is perhaps prohibited by the amendment. Plaintiff has alleged that he intends to mention epitaphs, slurs, and demeaning nicknames as part of his presentation on First Amendment and due process rights. 8.4G explicitly states that attorney's misconduct to, by words or conduct, knowingly manifest bias or prejudice. The plaintiff has shown that there is a credible threat of prosecution. Plaintiff alleged specific examples of individuals filing disciplinary and Title IX complaints against speakers who are presenting on similar topics as those discussed by the plaintiff. Plaintiff has demonstrated their substantial risk the amendments will result in plaintiff being subject to disciplinary complaint or an investigation. It can hardly be doubted that there will be those who offended by speech or written materials accompanying speech that manifest bias or prejudice who will, quite reasonably, insist the disciplinary board performs its sworn duty and apply Rule 8.4 in just the way the clear language of the rule permits. Even if the disciplinary process does not end in discipline, the threat of disruptive, intrusive, and expensive investigation and investigatory hearings into the words, speeches, notes, written materials, videos, mannerisms, and practice of law would cause plaintiff and any other attorney to be fearful of what he or she says and how he or she will say it in any form, public or private, that directly or tangentially touches upon the practice of law, including at speaking and engagements given during continuing legal education, bench bar conferences, or indeed any social gatherings formed around these activities. Plaintiff contends that Rule 8.4's prohibition on using words to manifest bias or prejudice or engage in harassment or discrimination is an unconstitutional viewpoint discrimination as well. Plaintiff contends the amendments allow for tolerant, benign, and respectful speech, but disallow biased prejudice, discriminatory, critical, and derogatory speech. So here he's pointing out the truth that the, the rule only prohibits mean words. So if you want to say nice things about races or nice things, that's fine. But if you want to say mean things, that's prohibited. And so it's not even subject matter. It's a viewpoint matter. You're only allowing some viewpoints and not others. You can't, you can't demean people, but if you want to uplift people, that's totally fine. Well, that's viewpoint. And that's uh, pretty much a constitutional no-no in First Amendment world. The court does recognize that Pennsylvania has an interest in licensing attorneys and the administration of justice. However, contrary to the defendant's contention, speech by an attorney or by a professional is only subject to greater regulation than speech by others in certain circumstances, none of which are present here. The Supreme Court in Gentile v. State of Bar of Nevada found that in a courtroom itself during judicial proceedings, whatever right a freedom of speech attorney has is circumscribed as it is for everybody in during the middle of a proceeding. Furthermore, even outside the courtroom, lawyers and pending cases are subject to ethical restrictions on speech of which an ordinary citizen would not necessarily be. The Supreme Court has expressed contemplated that speech of those participating before the courts could be limited, but not in all contexts. In contrast, Rule 8.4 does not limit its prohibition of words that manifest bias or prejudice to the legal process, since it also prohibits these words or conduct during activities that are required for a lawyer to practice law, including seminars or activities where legal education credits are offered. The court also finds that Rule 8.4 does not cover professional speech that's entitled to less protection. The court has not recognized professional speech as a separate category of speech. Rule 8.4 does not regulate professional conduct that is incidentally involved speech. The plain language of the rule expressly prohibits words that manifest bias or prejudice. A comment included in the proposal explains and illustrates that the rule was intended to regulate speech. Outside of the two contexts discussed above, disclosures under attorney advertising and professional conduct within the 
presence of the tribunal. The Supreme Court's precedents have long protected First Amendment rights of all professionals, including lawyers. The dangers associated with content-based regulation of speech are also present in the context of professional speech. As with other kinds of speech, regulating the content of professional speech poses an inherent risk the government seeks not to advance a legitimate regulatory goal, but to suppress unpopular ideas or information. States cannot choose the protection that speech receives under the First Amendment by imposing a licensing requirement that would give them a powerful tool to impose an invidious discrimination of disfavored subjects. If there is a bedrock principle underlying the First Amendment, it is that the government may not prohibit the expression of an idea simply because society finds the idea itself offensive or disagreeable. That is viewpoint discrimination. Giving offense is a viewpoint. At the most basic level, the test for viewpoint discrimination is whether, within the relevant subject category, the government has singled out a subset of messages to disfavor based on those viewpoints. Similarly, this rule, 8.4G, states that it's professional misconduct for a lawyer in the practice of law by words or conduct to knowingly manifest bias or prejudice, while Rule 8.4 restricts Pennsylvania's attorney's ability to express bias or prejudice based upon race, sex, gender identity, or expression, religion, national origin, ethnicity, disability, age, sexual orientation, marital status, or socioeconomic status, allows Pennsylvania attorneys to express tolerance or respect based on those exact same statuses. The irony cannot be missed that attorneys, those who are most educated and encouraged in dialogues about freedom, are the very ones here who are forced to limit their words to those that do not manifest bias or prejudice. The rule represents the government reaching outside of the courtroom, outside the context of a pending case, and even outside the most broader field of the administration of justice. Even if plaintiff makes a good faith attempt to restrict and self-censor, the rule leaves out plaintiff with no guidance as to what is in bounds and what is out, other than to advise plaintiff to scour every nook and cranny of each ordinance, rule, and law in the nation, which is asking quite a lot. Thus, that brings us to the end of our discussion of Zachary Greenberg versus James Haggerty. I think this may be the first court opinion written on the constitutionality of Rule 8.4G because it's not been very widely adopted. But there are some people trying to adopt this and make it make this wokeness be part of the attorney ethics. And this court does a really, really good job of pointing out how that doesn't fly under the attorney ethics rules because we have freedom of speech like everyone else and you can't discriminate certain viewpoints and certain and certain conduct like this. So the, the state of Pennsylvania Supreme Court published an improper ethics rule, and I hope this will stop any other state from following track, but at least for the moment, that's the end of the discussion of this case. Thank you so much for being part of the Uncivil Law family. If you enjoyed this legal education content, please hit the subscribe button. It really helps the channel grow. We appreciate your continuing support. Until later, my friends, cheers and goodbye.